What a simplistic phrase in that one song already done. You said it, I believe it. Simple, but yet most of us who have been experiencing the Christian life for any period of time now will tell you openly and honestly that it sometimes is actually really difficult. To simply recognize that if God said it, it's worth believing. And we're gonna look at one of the stories of Jesus that honestly in its application, we may struggle to believe it. Jesus said it, and he said it as true fiction. He made up a story to illustrate a point he wanted to get across to both religious people and irreligious or unchurched people who had no faith. He wanted them to grasp the overall principle of this fictitious story. Because the principle is true. And the principle is simple. God values us. He cares about us. He loves us. And we'll see in this story from Luke chapter 15 that he'll go to any length to secure us and let that love be practical and tangible and experienced in our lives. But it may be hard to believe it. And it may be hard to believe because depending on our circumstances, depending on the type of personality we have, it might just be difficult, it might just be hard to walk out of here this morning and be able to declare, not just verbally to the crowd, but to our own hearts, God loves me. I am important. I am valuable to almighty God. Because for the most part, in every other venue, we're going to hear messages that constantly reinforce a false belief and a false narrative that damages our hearts, our souls, and ultimately our lives. And that false narrative is you're not important. You're not valuable. You're expendable. If you're an inconvenience, you're unnecessary and you're unneeded. It is the exact opposite of what God says. And in Luke 15, we see the culture, and in this case, the religious culture, flat out articulating that without any question. No, there are certain people that are unvaluable, unnecessary, inappropriate, and we don't like them. But the great part is, while that happens, Jesus' true fiction, Jesus' true story will counteract that message and give us the true message that God wants us to understand, that we are valuable, that God values us, and that God has created a community of believers, of faithful, of righteous, of the church. And that community values us. And God has created an eternal spectrum filled with living creatures, filled with humans. And in that eternal spectrum, we are valued. In Luke chapter 15, in verse one, the story begins to unfold. And it unfolds with a very blunt description of the current environment in which Jesus is experiencing the necessity for the search and the defense of the search that he's going to create and the fact that culture never accurately assesses who we are. Luke chapter 15, verse one. You've got Bibles in front of you. We encourage you to always use, um, we use the YouVersion app and you can actually find the notes in the YouVersion app. You just simply go to events and under events you locate our church and the notes are already typed out including the scriptures so that you have all that information available. In Luke 15, verse one, all the tax collectors and sinners, these are people that culture had labeled inappropriate, unnecessary, distasteful. They had sold out to Rome and the Jewish community hated them. 
They had sold out to the oppressing government and their responsibility was to collect funds from innocent people who were oppressed and give it to that government and they were hated people. Sinners is just an all-inclusive term to describe people who don't do what we like. Because at this point, the valuation is being made by the culture, not by God. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes, these religious leaders, they were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus begins this parable, this story. What an accusation to defile, devalue a group of people. This man welcomes them and even entertains them, spends time with them. And that's the judgment. And that's the judgment we experience every day, sometimes from sources we can't control, like culture, like society, like media, sometimes from sources we can't control that penetrate much deeper. Sometimes it's in families, sometimes it's in systems like schools and government, sometimes it's in communities. Communities can take on this harsh, judgmental, better than everyone else sort of personality and come to the conclusion that somebody is not worth it. They're not worth any effort. They're not worth any expenditure of energy or resource. Don't spend money on those people. Don't welcome those people. Don't entertain them. They might stay. And already probably images are going through your mind of areas and people and and subgroups of society and culture that you're thinking because of what you watched on the news this week or what you saw on TikTok this week, oh, he's talking about those people. I'm just going to tell you right now, openly and honestly, because I'm struggling with that myself even as I teach, I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about any person who is devalued in any shape or form, and at any point in time. In our current culture, we we devalue unborn children. We don't think they're worthwhile. We don't think they're worth the effort to suspend inappropriate legal and legislation and laws that took place in the past wrongly, under a wrong impression. We think they're such an inconvenience, they should be disposed of at any point in time. I can't point to them and say, well, they're tearing up the park. I can't point to them and say, well, they're potentially creating damage to the building. They haven't even been born yet. And our culture says they're not worth it. That's why I love so deeply what Jesus says. Because he reminds us that no matter how bad, no matter how horrific, no matter how negative we have heard the assessment on our lives, That's not the way God thinks. And we can simply, in a moment, recalculate and recalibrate who we are and what we believe and understand and hopefully walk out here, maybe just grasping it with the the smallest little grip on it, that God values us, even if nobody else does. The story begins in verse 4. What man among you, he's talking to an agrarian society, so this makes sense in their culture. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? This is the priority, the, the prioritizing of the search. Now, for years it always bothered me and then I had the opportunity to study Mideast culture and understand the way shepherds worked and functioned at that point in time helps me grasp this a little bit. Because I always thought to myself, and I think partially because culture and circumstances had caused me for multiple years, I still struggle with it as an adult, to believe I wasn't worth anybody's effort. I wasn't worth anybody's time expenditure. That nobody really thought 
I was that important or that, that much of a priority. So I had troubles grasping that God might possibly feel that way about me. And so I'd always look at this passage of scripture and I'd say, what, that doesn't seem right. He's gonna leave the other 99? This guy's got a herd of 100 and he's going to leave and endanger the other 99? We don't have time to go into it today, but possibly at some point in this series, we'll look back at it. But in John, the Gospel of John, Jesus describes himself as a good shepherd. And one of the characteristics of the good shepherd is that he has spent so much time with his sheep that the sheep recognize his voice. When you look at the history of the ancient Mideast, shepherds would do that. They would train their small flocks to respond to them individually. And at night, oftentimes because of security issues, they would come together and have communal herds. They would bring three, four, five, even six different herds together into one enclosure. And then the next morning when it came time to sort them out, I always thought like any good cattleman that they checked the brands and sent them different ways. But that's not how they did it in the ancient Near East. What they would do is stand at the entrance to that enclosure and one at a time, each shepherd would call out for his sheep and they would recognize his voice and they would begin to move out and sort themselves. It was a great relief for me because I was always worried about that 99. They were safe, which is an amazing testimony that God doesn't want anybody unsafe and unvalued. So he takes care of the 99 while he sets off on the adventure to rescue the one. And I love the phrase at the end of that verse, until he finds it. I don't know how many of you had the chance. I I wanted to pull up and see if I could find a picture online and show you, but if you watched the game last night, Uh, Martin Maldonado, who we know is one of the very best baseball players in the history of baseball. Um, We would be personal friends if he only knew I existed. Um, But he was out on the field before the game. And he was playing with his two-year-old son. His two-year-old son out there on the field, and the two-year-old son had a ball cap on and had, you know, was out there ready to play, had a, had a mitt, and, and Martin was tossing the ball to his little son and, and just, you know, not machete style, if you're familiar with the Astros, very, very kindly, very simply, and he's catching it. But Martin's son, and one of the things I love about Martin is Martin takes the game serious, if you've ever noticed that. He would display it later in about the fourth inning, how serious he thought the game was when a call didn't go his direction. But anyway, we don't want to go there. Um, But the little two-year-old boy had a t-shirt on that said, winners never quit. You know, the biggest winner I know in the history of the world is God. Here's going to be the difficult part that God has made clear to us, but we have to learn to believe it. The one person in this room that God never quit, never gave up on, is you, it's me. He's out there all the time looking for that one and he's not gonna stop. He will never give up, he will never let go, he will never stop trying to bring us into relationship with him. The search is a priority because God values us. And then from a completely different perspective, Jesus says in verse eight, there's a woman. And this woman has 10 silver coins, and if she loses one coin, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? The house doesn't need to be clean. It's a Palestinian house. It's got a dirt floor, hard packed over time of use, and on top of that, to help with the insulation and to to help with issues related to moisture and mud and sterilization, she's got hay and straw all over the floor, and if she drops something of that small nature onto that that floor and it rolls up or moves up or gets shifted underneath that straw or gets shifted up against the side of the wall, she'll never find it with casual observation. And so she lights the place up and she starts moving things around and sweeping back and forth and stirring everything until she finds that coin. That coin which is probably part of her wedding dowry. 
which was typically 10 coins given to a woman at the time of her marriage. It was that ancient culture's basically processed like our rings. She was given it to, in her ceremony and she would keep it and she would treasure it. It's, it's valuable financially, but it's more valuable sentimentally. It is the equivalent of losing your wedding ring. Most people I know would search and search and search until they found that wedding ring. And this fictitious lady that Jesus tells this truth about is searching, and notice the phrase that Jesus uses at the end of verse eight, until she finds it. She's not giving up. She's not letting somebody redefine value or redefine what's important or what's prioritized. She already knows, and she is not going to stop until she finds it. And we can try to redefine everything. We can try to revision history in our North American culture, in our Western civilization. We can do that all we want and we can pass legislation that is an atrocity to the very nature of the way God values human creatures. We can do that all we want, but God isn't changing his mind. And he's not stopping he loves each and every one of us and he loves each and every person who's not here. And he cares for them. And he's searching for them. And he's looking for them. Yes, that neighbor that mows their lawn early on Sunday morning while we're trying to sleep late and skirt in here at the last minute. God loves them. Yes, that family that is so broken right now that last night was more like a war than a household. And today's the aftermath and the injury and the woundedness. God loves them. And yes, those of us who are having great weekends and a great time and thankful to be at church, God loves us. God values us. And then I love how Jesus puts this value in the context of the things he has created in order for us to experience that value. He prioritizes the search, and then there's a redemption, there's a redeeming side of the search. In verse five, this shepherd, when he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders because truthfully, some of us who get lost and get wayward, we're not gonna find our way back. And we need a shepherd who's willing to put us on his shoulders and carry us back. Coming home in verse six, he calls all his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. The lady does the same thing in verse nine. When she finds it, the coin, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I have found the silver coin I lost. Redeeming the search is because God has created community to express our value. God values us, and Christian community values us. Maybe your mom was one of those moms that every Sunday morning wanted you to go to church with her. And it got irritating, and it got frustrating, and at times you weren't sure it was worth it. She did that because she understood how important you were to God. It wasn't just about her. It may have felt that way. It wasn't just about her. She understood how important you were to God because God's community values us. It's sad because we are sinners and we are imperfect and it is sad. Sometimes you can come to church and comments will be made and expressions will happen and you'll feel out of place or you'll feel ostracized or you'll feel hurt in some form or fashion. I regret that. We do everything we can to avoid that and to, and to deal with that, but it happens because we're sinners. There's not a perfect person in this building. There never has been in the 113 years we've been here and there will be no perfect person until Jesus comes back and he swings over and picks us up and takes us with him. And even then, we're going to be imperfect until we're actually with him. So let's just admit, things go wrong in church. But overall, God's plan is the right plan. He created church as a community to value, to value you. That's why when you were baptized, people probably applauded. And if they didn't, they were probably in a quiet church that just hadn't really been taught the right way of applause. 
They may have been a little bit like us. We are at times sort of clap impaired. We just have to deal with that. The first most inclusive experience I had ever had in my life was the day I walked downstairs from the baptistry and people were glad that I got baptized. This is the first thing I remember doing in my entire life where I didn't do it to try to impress somebody. I did it because Jesus had changed my life. And it was so relieving to know that everybody agreed that was a good change. It wasn't always that way, it hadn't always been that way. The joy of being a pastor is you get both sides of the church. And you experience it and you process it. But for the most part, church has always been that place I go to to be reminded. I'm important. I'm valuable. I'm loved. And regardless of my mistakes, even regardless of all the the false attempts to try to promote myself in some form to feel loved, I didn't have to do it because God loved me and his people love me. God loves you and his people love you. And we're thankful for you. The community rejoices. The last one is the shortest and the simplest, but for me, one of the hardest to believe. There is a celebration of the search because God has designed heaven in such a way that heaven itself values us. In verse seven, after the sheep is restored in Jesus' story, he says, I tell you, and he has the authority to tell us, this is the true part of the fiction, because he's been there and he's seen it happen. He's not making this part up. He had witnessed it himself before he came to earth because Jesus pre-existed in eternity before anything created existed. Jesus existed because he's always been God and he always will be God. I tell you, In the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. I remember the first time I read that and then later the first time I heard a pastor teach on that. I've, I've struggled for years grasping this, so try to grasp it with me this morning. The day you ask Jesus to be a part of your life, heaven, angels, started celebrating. Some tra- it's not included in the translations because the words aren't there in the original language. But most scholars agree that this is an indication of celebration that gives the impression of almost an uncontrollable laugh to the point that you're crying. In a place where tears don't exist, angels come close to shedding a tear because they're so happy you made the decision to follow Jesus. Because you were rescued. Because God came into your life and picked you up and placed you on his shoulders and brought you back home and gave you community to be a part of. And you are so valued that angels are thrilled at the experience. And just to make sure like he does with both of these stories that we catch the point in verse 10, he says it again. I tell you, this is now the lady with the coin in the same way. There is joy in the presence of God's angels over every sinner who repents. Confession of sin always seems so hard and so difficult because it plays in the tapes that we have in our heads that say we're not worth it We're not worth the effort. Look, we screwed up. We messed up. That's what we hear all the time. Jesus tells this story and he says, you know what? When a sinner finally gets around to repenting, when a sinner finally realizes he's made mistakes that have created consequences that are bad, when a sinner finally realizes, yeah, he really is lost and he needs rescue, When that sinner realizes, no, those things I did, I shouldn't have done, or that thing I forgot to do or didn't do, I should have done, and I recognize that sin, I recognize I've moved away from where God wanted me to be, that is not a solemn, difficult moment that further devalues us. It is a moment of celebration in which God is able to express in his angels, which precede us in creation, are able to rejoice. They're glad we've confessed our sin. They're happy we've said, I'm gonna follow Jesus from now on. 
They're thrilled. And they're watching. Which that's what this, this story indicates, is that they are aware. They're aware of when we sing, and they're aware of when we study the scriptures, and, and they're aware of when we make decisions that align us with the love God had for us all along. Even heaven values us. Culture is going to devaluate us. Society is going to devaluate us. Statistics and analytics are going to devaluate us. They're going to tell us we're too old or we're too young. You're never right. You're always something. But God's always going to say the same thing over and over again. I love you. Kelly, I love you. Livia, I love you. Bailey, I love you. Alan, I love you. Roy, I love you. Steve, I love you. Josh, I love you. Everyone in here, everyone has a name and God knows it. And everyone is of of importance and God cares. And he thinks you're the most important thing that he needs to deal with today. You're the top of his schedule. You're the highest priority he's got because he values you. Me, I made that decision years ago, but I need to revisit that decision every once in a while and just say, okay, If God thinks I'm this important, I want to listen to him and I want to follow him. That first night I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I know I've sinned. I believe you can do something about it. And you can help me be a new man. He answered that prayer. But I need to revisit it every once in a while because sometimes the other voices get too loud. And I start thinking I'm not really worth it. I start thinking it's not all that important. I start thinking things didn't work out quite the way I thought they would. I just need to hear his voice one more time saying, James, I love you. And you are the most valuable individual and the highest priority of my agenda today. It's hard. He said it, and now it's in our court. Will we believe it?